Welcome to season four of the BizHack Live Strive 305 Digital Marketing Masterclass Series. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy uh, and the host of this masterclass series done in partnership with the Office of the Mayor uh, of Miami-Dade County, Daniela Levine Cava. Uh, and today uh, we have a real treat in store for you, uh, Daryl Weber, um, an expert in the, uh, the, uh, how neuroscience and marketing connect and helping you as a small business owner uh, translate some of those insights into how you communicate uh, with your customers. Daryl is the second, uh, actually the third of five different master classes that we're doing. Uh, we've had uh, Bruce Turkel, uh, we, next, uh, in two weeks, we have Suzanne Jewell. We've also talked about influencer marketing on Instagram, and we're going to talk about business storytelling as part of a uh, really uh, amazing, um, growing season four uh, of this amazing work that we're doing with the Office of the Mayor. Today, we're going to talk specifically about brand seduction, how neuroscience can help small businesses build memorable brands with Daryl Weber. He's the author of a book of the same name, uh, which we'll highly recommend. And as a special gift uh, for coming uh, for you today, for coming today, uh, you're going to get at the end of this presentation, a, a beautiful workbook that Daryl has developed that um, you as a small business can use to apply some of these insights uh, to your own work. Um, again, I wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, the Office of the Mayor of Miami-Dade County and their Strive 305 initiative, uh, and I'd like to welcome Danilo Vargas from the Diversity and Inclusion Office uh, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Dan, and good afternoon to everyone. It's so great to be with you. My name is Danilo Vargas, and I am the Small Business Innovation Manager in the Office of the Mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. And, you know, I've been a small business owner and an entrepreneur for a long time. And one of the keys to success that I've been able to find is to continue learning and stretching our minds so that we can come to the task of creating great products and services that our customers will absolutely love. And so for me, learning comes a lot from books. And I was in my happy place, which is the bookstore, and I came across this gem right, which is Daryl Weber's Brand Seduction. It immediately grabbed me. On the back, you see that it's highly recommended. And so I got the physical copy, I got the audio book, and I started listening and studying his ideas. And sure enough, they stretched my mind. They helped me think about branding in a way I hadn't thought about branding before. And that's exactly the kind of growth that we need in order to build thriving businesses. So as part of the Mayor's Strive 305 initiative, we want to bring you in partnership with this hack the best and the brightest to teach you how to become better marketers, better brand strategists, so you can really build the business of your dreams. And so with that, I just wanna say, you know, we reached out to Daryl and he was so gracious and kind and immediately said yes. And so we've been looking to this day for a couple of months and I'm super excited along with Dan and Lydia that this is happening. And I just wanna say two last things. Number one, Daryl, thank you so much for your kindness and generosity and for spending this time with us and helping our small business owners. Thank you so much. And to all the small business owners in the audience today, please, you're in for a treat. Please take lots of notes. And more importantly, whatever idea you hear today speaks the loudest to you, make a commitment to practice it today, not tomorrow, but today, right? So you can start having that transformation in your small business. So with that, thank you all so much. And back to you, Dan. Yeah, thank you so much. So we're midway through our fourth season. We have broken one of our initial goals, which is we have served with live instruction now more than a thousand businesses uh, in the county uh, on our way to 10,000 to meet the very ambitious Drive 305 goals. And we're just very honored to be partners with you in this incredible journey. And Daryl, thank you again for uh, you know sharing your um, amazing insights, and we're looking forward to hearing from more from you shortly. Uh, our media sponsor is the South Florida PBS station and their health channel. And uh, the reason that we've been able to serve a thousand businesses uh, and counting is because of our amazing promotional partners, uh, the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, ICABA, the Miami Foundation, the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College, 
the American Marketing Association of South Florida, CIC, South Florida Interactive Marketing Association, Miami Bayside Foundation, um, the Key Biscayne Chamber of Commerce, Creative Station Business, Cutler Bay Business Association, the Florida State Minority Supplier Diversity Count Development Council, Community Fund of North Miami-Dade Access Helps, Coconut Grove Chamber, Miami-Dade Beacon Council, Aventura Marketing Council, and the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce. One of the reasons that we love promoting our promotional partners uh, is not just to thank them for spreading the word about this amazing free series, but this is kind of a who's who uh, of organizations in this county that are serving small businesses uh, and, and businesses like yours. And so every single one of these uh, is worth you, you getting to know. They all offer their own programs, services, and offerings that could help you take your business to the next level. So as I said, my name's Dan Gretsch. I'm a business storyteller. Uh, I'm an unreformed 20-year uh, journalist for uh, NPR, PBS, the Miami Herald, uh, who's now become a business storyteller, helping businesses tell their brand story more effectively so that they can have a bigger impact and make more money. As a thank you for coming here today, uh, you're gonna get uh, an incre incredible workbook from uh, Daryl. Uh, you'll also get a link to our YouTube channel where a recording of this will be up by tomorrow. Uh, you'll get an automatic registration for the two remaining masterclass sessions for season four. And we have an incredible season five that we'll be announcing before too long. And uh, you also get some information about some of the scholarship programs that BizHack offers uh, for uh, minority uh, underserved women-owned businesses. Uh, we are very committed to serving underrepresented business owners, uh, and we have a scholarship program. In fact, if you stick around a little bit after Daryl's talk, uh, I'm going to take a, a few minutes to just talk about that scholarship program in a little uh, info session. So uh, without further ado, brand seduction, how neuroscience can help small businesses build memorable brands. Daryl Weber is a brand consultant, speaker, and entrepreneur, and the author of a book by the same name. He worked as the head of strategy for Red Scout, um, which was a, a boutique brand and innovation consultancy. And he also worked at one of the biggest and most uh, lasting brands uh, in all of uh, capitalism, which is the Coca-Cola company. Uh, it's amazing what you can do selling sugar water. Um, he also launched his own brand uh, of modern sleepwear. I, I don't know if you're wearing that sleepwear today, Daryl, uh, but you do look very comfortable uh, called Bedfellow. Would love to hear a little bit more about that. And he's an alumnus of Columbia University and lives in New York with uh, two, uh, his wife and two sons. So without further ado, Daryl Weber, welcome to the Strive 305 BizHack Masterclass Series. Thank you so much, Dan, and, and for the kind words, Dan and Danilo, all of you. Very glad to be here and happy to have the opportunity. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Give me one second. Um, all right, that looked good. Yeah, looks great. Yeah, so I want to talk today, uh, kind of give hopefully a new perspective on how we can think about brands and branding. I know this course overall is, you know, under the umbrella of digital marketing. Uh, my personal specialty is within branding, so kind of a subset of marketing, if you will. Um, just quickly to get those maybe definitions out of the way. For me, uh, branding is more of a long term. It's a deeply emotional. It's not, you know, many people will hear the word brand and they think immediately a logo or a tagline or a name. Those are pieces. Those are sort of the external facing pieces of a brand. Um, but what I'm going to get into here is sort of much more the deeper, you know, what's what does a brand mean? What does it stand for? What is it? How does it feel? What is the story it's telling um, you? Uh, not just at a conscious level, but as you can see by my title here at an unconscious level. Um, and that's what I find really fascinating. Uh, yeah, I worked as a brand consultant for many large brands um, from Nike to Diageo, which owns many of the top liquor brands uh, from Captain Morgan to Tanqueray to Guinness and uh, many more Johnny Walker. Uh, and then I moved to Coca-Cola and obviously one of the biggest, if not you know, the most recognizable brand in the world uh, and worked on many of their brands as well. And I just found it fascinating how marketers are often, you know, naturally very focused on the conscious side of brands, um, but I had studied neuroscience undergrad and really was just fascinated by it and continued to research it and study it on my own and just found that there was all this 
understanding of how the mind works, how the brain works, how consumer decision-making uh, happens. Uh, and that just wasn't getting communicated over to the marketers who could benefit from it. So that was really my goal with the book and kind of really diving into this whole world of what is that unconscious side of brands? How does that come to life? How does that influence our decision-making day to day? Um, and I found it really fascinating um, and kind of opened up a whole new way of thinking about brands and marketing. And that's, I hope, I wanna just kind of give you a bit of that today and open your eyes to that side of it. So, you know, even that word unconscious, you know, I think for, for many of us, uh, I don't know what comes to mind, but maybe you think of being passed out on the floor unconscious or the sort of subliminal messaging and subliminal ads, those kinds of things. That's not what I mean. I'm actually more talking about what many neuroscientists today call the adaptive unconscious. So that is all the processes that are going on behind the scenes in your brain that we're not aware of. Um, and there's so much, right? Like right now, hopefully you're, you know, sitting upright, your body's, your, your brain is keeping your muscles intact. It's keeping your body in homeostasis. So right hormones at the right levels, your temperature, uh, your breathing, your heart beating, right? Tons of things are happening without us even being aware of it, right? So I think it's fair to say we're actually barely conscious most of the time, right? Most of when we're going through the world, we only have access to a tiny bit of what our brain is doing. And, you know, this is a very cliched metaphor, but it is very true, right? It is like a tip of the iceberg, right? There's just so much beyond underneath the surface that we just have no access to and we don't know what's going on. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, we all have a brain, we all have a mind, we're all consumers ourselves. So I think there's a tendency to feel like I understand a consumer psychology because I'm a consumer and I have a brain and I make these decisions. Um, but what I kind of want to you know, maybe get you to think is, is maybe I don't know the full story, right? Even though I have a brain myself, it's actually telling us an, a misleading, almost giving us an illusion of what, of how our brain works. Um, our brain really simplifies a lot of things for us. So we can just focus on the task at hand, what we're doing right now, what needs our attention. And it does so much else in the background that we, we don't really understand, or we don't, we're not aware of ourselves, but scientists now are beginning to understand more and more. So I want to give you a few examples of how this kind of works in day-to-day in -day life. This is a photo of one of my sons, my older son, when he was six months old. Uh, he's now much older, but he's, he's still pretty cute. Um, and, you know, when we look out into the world, so our, our vision, right, this is an example of vision, we see something like this. We see color, we see everything in focus. Um, you know, it, it looks right side up. It looks, you know, our normal everyday world, but that is very different actually than what is hitting your brain. What is going from your eye, the back of your eye to your brain. What's actually from your eye, it looks much more like this. So it's inverted because everything gets flipped when it hits your retina. We actually see mostly in black and white, except for in the direct center where your fovea is, which is in color, but your brain is filling in all these rich colors in your peripheral vision. We actually even have a large blind spot on both sides of your visual field. And there's different sort of exercises you can do with your hand to find your blind spot. There's the veins that are going in front that we don't see, right? Our brain kind of filters all that out and flips the image, fills in the color, fills in the details, and we have this rich view of the world without even trying, without even thinking about it, right? But your brain is really filling in a lot of those gaps on its own to give us a nice, beautiful, crisp image. And this is what optical illusions play on, right? This is a very sort of simple one, but most of us will probably see a white triangle here kind of pointing down, right? Kind of at the front of this. But really there is no white triangle. There are sort of three black angles in the corners and three sort of Pac-Man looking figures. Uh, but our brain says this wouldn't be a coincidence. There must be a, a white uh, triangle there overlapping these other ones, right? And it, almost like I almost see like a gray outline across these, you know, where that triangle would be. But of course those aren't there. Your brain is just saying there must be a triangle there. And it's hard to even override it. Once you know that that's the case, right? It's still, you still see the triangle, right? It's hard to not see it. Um, that's how powerful our, our sort of unconscious mind is in telling us what we see in the world. And this works for sound and how you move through the world and, and kind of everything, right? There's so much going on. So we're mostly unconscious, uh, and that actually kind of makes us highly irrational at the same time. I don't know if any of you would be familiar with the book, um, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, uh, famous behavioral economist out of Duke. But he, um, he kind of coined that phrase, predictably irrational, saying we humans do things that maybe made sense throughout our evolution over millions of years, but in today's world, they really don't. And, and we have these kind of quirks that, that pop up. And I'll show you a few examples of how this exists in, um, in business today. There's some beautiful studies that have kind of brought out all these quirks. I just picked out a few. This one 
was they asked people to fill out a survey as they were leaving a grocery store, right? They had just bought a bunch of items. They asked you to answer a few questions and they would hand them a pen and a clipboard with paper. And as they would go through and fill out the questions, one question going back to a soda, I did work at Coke, so this is close to my heart. Um, they asked them, what is your favorite soda? And interestingly, some people got a green pen to fill out this questionnaire with green ink. Some people got an orange pen with orange ink. And wouldn't you know it, the people that were given the green pen were more likely to say that Sprite was their favorite soda. And the people who got the orange pen were more likely to say Fanta was their favorite soda. Right, and it's just one of those, it was giving them some kind of cue, you know, and, and made them give, give a different choice without them even knowing it. Where there's been tons of studies with wine, I find these particularly fascinating. Um, one I was just reading about where they asked people, they gave people a really nice dinner, a nice meal to have. They poured them some wine and they either told some people that the wine was from North Dakota, nothing against North Dakota. Uh, and another, another set of people where they told them the wine, the same exact wine, same exact food, that the wine is from Napa Valley, California, right? So some people told North Dakota, some Napa. Interestingly, not only did people say, of course, as you would expect, the wine tasted better from, from Napa, even though it's the same wine, they also even said the food tasted better when they were drinking the Napa Valley, Napa Valley wine, um, even though it's the same. Or, you know, they played different music in a uh, wine store. They would play German music or French music. And when they're playing German music, more German wine was sold. When they played French music, more French wine was sold. And of course, if you asked any of the people who were buying it, they didn't realize that. They wouldn't even know what German music sounds like. It was purely unconscious. Um, or they played classical music versus pop music. They played actually Justin Bieber in this one study, right? Um, people tended to spend more on wine when the classical music was playing than when Justin Bieber was playing, right? And again, no one would attribute their choice of wine to the music that was playing in the store. Our last one, this is kind of one of my favorites. Uh, this is a picture of the Mars Curiosity rover. So this is an older rover from back in the late 90s, actually. Uh, I think it was the first rover that landed on Mars. And it was big news. We're landing a rover on Mars. Very exciting. It was, you know, everyone's talking about it. It's in all the newspapers, back when people read newspapers. Uh, and, you know, it was a big, big thing on people's minds. And what happened at that same time was that Mars bar sales skyrocketed. <laughs> Right, so obviously the Mars bars have nothing to do with the Mars rover except in name. Um, and of course, people buying the Mars bars wouldn't say it's because of the rover, but it was you know, made a bit more top of mind. It was on their minds and then they're more likely to choose that one, right? So all this to kind of say, you know, we are, we are not as conscious, we are not as rational as maybe we like to think we are as we move through this world. And there's one, um, oops. One neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio, I love this quote from him, that we are not thinking machines. We're really feeling machines that think. <laughs> so, you know, we think we're kind of thinking our way through this world, planning, strategizing. Uh, but really, his point is that we're really feeling our way through the world. We have sort of gut feelings that guide us. And yeah, we have some conscious thought as well, but that's really a very small part of it. And really, it's these emotions um, that actually move us to action. And um, even the word emote, apparently the Latin root of it um, comes from motion, is the same, same sort of root verb, right? And it's actually, it's to get us to take action, our emotions. He had a fascinating study, uh, Antonio Damasio, that I just wanna explain here briefly, because I think it really highlights something. And I, I talk about this in the book as well. This was called the Iowa Gambling Task, where this is sort of a screenshot from it. He actually had people do it in real life too, but this was a online or computerized version of it, where he would give people four decks of cards, say A, B, C, and D here. And it was very simple. They just had to flip over the cards from the different decks. And each card would say if they won money or lost money. This was sort of fake money, it wasn't real. Um, but still, it would, they were, the goal of the game was try to win as much money as you can. And it would seem very random as you're flipping over these cards from the different decks. Sometimes you would win more, sometimes you would lose some, sometimes you would win a little bit. And they were, while people were doing this, they were hooked up to sensors. And there was one that was attached to their skin on their hands that was called a, a galvanic skin response sensor. And that is it kind of a, a precursor to sweating. But if you get a little bit nervous or a little bit anxious, uh, this will pick up on it, right? And kind of sense this precursor to sweating in your hands. So they're kind of monitoring that and your heart rate and breathing and other things. And as you're flipping cards over, you know, you're kind of just guessing randomly, it feels like at the time. But what the respondents didn't know is that two of the cards are actually rigged or two of the decks are rigged to be better and they have more good prizes and less bad ones. And the other ones were bad where they had a lot more um, bad penalties where you would lose money. 
but it was really hard to tell because you're flipping so many over. What they found was they would ask the respondents, you know, which, which pile is better? Are you picking any strategy? And conscious, their conscious mind would say, no, I'm just picking randomly, I'm not sure. Um, until about uh, 50 cards, I believe it was. They had to flip over about 50 cards and then they would finally get, okay, cards, uh, decks C and D are bad and so I'm gonna avoid them and decks A and B are better and where I'll win more money. But what they found was the unconscious mind was actually much more attuned to what was going on here and paying more attention and was able to sort of keep track. And they unconsciously started skewing their behavior to choose from decks A and B after only around 15 cards instead of 50, right? So the unconscious mind was doing that and changing their action, but the conscious mind didn't know it. And they could tell with that skin response that they were getting a little nervous when they were reaching towards decks C and D because they were getting a bit more of those punishments from them. And they started to then avoid decks C and D because they sort of unconsciously had a feeling that those weren't as good and I should avoid those. And they started choosing from A and B at around 15 cards, but their conscious mind wouldn't answer it until 50 cards later. And they said, okay, A and B are better decks. I'm gonna stick with those. So it's just sort of a fascinating study, right? That shows that that unconscious mind and our emotions can be really way ahead of our conscious mind and can be influencing our behavior before we even notice it. So kind of, you know, the point here, unconscious emotions are commonly referred as gut feelings, right? We all have a gut feeling towards something are really what's driving our actions. And you can see this, you know, if you're walking down the aisle in a grocery store, um, you know, maybe you're buying detergent and you pick up Tide and throw it in the basket without really giving it a second thought. Maybe, you know, that brand Tide, it has that bright orange color. Maybe that sort of vibrancy, you know, feels bright and fresh and that's what you want from your detergent and your clothes. Maybe you've seen it on your, you know, mom's uh, pantry growing up or your friend's houses. Uh, maybe that name Tide kind of cues fresh water, you know, clean, bright, fresh, all those things. You probably don't think about them at all, but maybe they're there in the back of your head uh, and you just have an affinity towards that brand or whichever brand you have an affinity towards, right? Um, and maybe that makes you more likely to put it in your basket without you realizing. So this gets me to my next point that we're really learning about brands all the time, even if we don't realize it, right? Our, brands are, our brains are kind of like sponges that are just absorbing every little thing and all these interactions, just like those cards that we're flipping over without us even keeping track of it or, or noticing it, right? As we go through the world, we see brands everywhere, not just in ads, but people wearing things, people holding things um, online, we see different things, right? And all those little bits of information are added to the pile of how we feel about something. Uh, an example of this that you might be familiar with, this is called the cocktail party effect. Um, I love this, I had noticed this my whole life and thought, how does this happen? It's like, say you're talking to someone at a loud bar or a party, it's noisy in the background, but you're listening to the person you're talking to, right? And the rest of it is a din, you're not hearing anything specifically, but then you hear your name. Maybe someone says your name over there. Maybe they're talking not even about you, just someone the same name, it'll pop out of that din, right? You'll hear it, you'll, you'll look, you'll say, hey, my, my name was over there. That shows something very interesting about the mind, right? It shows that your mind was actually processing all of that information, all of that auditory you know, noise that you weren't listening to was somehow being processed enough for it to pick out your name and say, oh, you should pay attention to that. That's something that's interesting and applies to you. Um, so it just shows how the brain is kind of working at different levels, right? You're consciously having this one conversation, but it's listening to a lot of other things and absorbing those things. To show how this works with brands, this was a, another fascinating study um, this one was done in the University of Pennsylvania by um, um, Jonah Berger, Professor Jonah Berger. Uh, this was for the Puma brand of sneakers and clothes. What he did was he showed people sets of images. So they would look through a whole um, set of like 100 images and it would be all random things, right? Cars, clouds, can be anything. Um, but one set of people were shown more dog images in their set, right? So kind of random stuff, but then a lot of dogs were shown in it. What does that have to do with anything, right? Uh, and then he had them fill out a questionnaire of different, you know, asking them about different brands and preferences and stuff. And what he found was that people who were shown more images of dogs actually then were more likely to have a preference for the Puma brand. <laughs> that to me is amazing, right? Like why would that dogs have anything to do with the Puma brand? But his hypothesis was, it's kind of a network of associations that we have for any concept in the mind, for how we think of any product or thing even. Um, so his point was the Puma brand is the name Puma. It's the sort of great cat. It has an image of this cat on its logo, on its boxes, on its clothes. 
Uh, and he's saying, in your mind, Puma is connected to cats and cats are connected to dogs. And I can, what's called priming, I can prime this connection by showing you something related. So showing you images of dogs, primes it, makes this association a little bit more top of mind and can skew your preference slightly. So really a sort of amazing sort of um, outward connection there. And this is you know, an example of that sort of network of associations or connections, right? So I did one here for cows. Uh, very sort of simple, right? This is how it kind of might exist in your mind, right? You have this idea of cow, but that is connected to all these other things like milk or it's a mammal or beef or farms. And then those in turn might have their own connections, right? And it goes kind of out. So cheese is connected to cow through milk indirectly, right? And as you activate one of these sort of nodes in this network, that activation spreads and can prime and um, queue up some of these other connections as well. It's a bit like dropping a stone in a pond, right? Where those ripples will go outward and spread from the node. So very sort of fascinating stuff. And this is sort of those levels of associations that we really are not aware of, but are in your mind. Um, and actually, you know, we can, this is a cow. It sort of can be for any concept. You know, I've seen it for doctors or anything. Um, and my hypothesis was that this would be the same for brands, right? Any brand would have a similar sort of network of associations and connections. And that really is my definition of a brand. I've seen many definitions of brands out there. There's no maybe right or wrong one. Um, but this to me just kind of makes sense that a brand is a collection of associations in consumers' minds, right? So all those things you've picked up on the brand throughout the years, um, any, any place you've seen it, anything you've done with it, these are all sort of forming and shaping this sort of gut feeling, this you know, network of messy associations that now fit in your mind connected to that brand. Uh, I like this cover from the New Yorker. It's a very old one, but it uh, it kind of brings this idea to life. This is sort of a, someone looking at a painting in a museum and all these sort of thoughts that are interconnected are kind of in his head, even if he's not consciously thinking all of them, but they're just really messy and interconnected. And I'll, I'll show you how this kind of came to life when I was doing some consulting work. I was working uh, for Kettle One Vodka, which was recently was bought at the time by Diageo, who was my client. Uh, and they wanted to understand what is driving the Kettle One brand? Why it had been growing you know, really strongly. Um, this is going back like 10 years or so, but at that time it, it was really strong. And what, what is driving it? How is it eating into Grey Goose's, which was at the time the leader in, in vodka, since then Tito's has kind of come on really strong in that category. Um, but they want, so we did some focus groups to understand what is driving it. And we had them do, you know, we talked about it. First, we had a, a discussion and it was very hard for consumers to really differentiate between these two brands. They would say, both of them are smooth, they're high end, they're premium, they cost about the same, they're for the same type of person. I drink them in the same types of places. All those sort of conscious associations were the same. But then we pushed a little farther and we tried to dig deeper and we had them do what we call projective exercises. So these are probing a bit more into the unconscious and having people get away from the literal and go into you know, other associations they might have with these brands. So the first thing, one of the things we did was uh, a collage. We had them cut out different images from magazines and put together a collage that just brought to life the feeling of these brands. So we had Kettle One drinkers who love that brand and we had Grey Goose drinkers who love that brand. And what we found was fascinating. Here at the unconscious level, the brands felt very different. Grey Goose feels you know, very sleek, minimal, modern, stylish. Um, and you, you would see sort of those types of images, right? Clean lines, ice, you know, open skies, very sort of clean looking. But then for Kettle One's collage, it was totally different. We saw pictures of boxers, like sweaty boxers, um, people playing, you know, men playing poker, uh, scotch, actually like brown liquor, which has, you know, feels very different from vodka in a lot of ways, um, but very sort of masculine, powerful, sort of strong, robust type images. Uh, and what we found was that's how then people described it. And one person in particular that's really stood out in my mind, uh, you know, said, Kettle One's just the brand that I can bang on the table. You know, it's, a, it's the one that I just knock down. He's like, Grey Goose, you have to gingerly, calmly press on the table. Um, I thought that was fascinating, right? And when we got to it, it's really just these little cues from the bottle itself, right? Like it just has these ridges, it has thicker lines, and it just feels like a stronger, more robust brand, maybe the name Kettle One. Most of these people, by the way, would spell the name incorrectly, even though they're loyalists to the brand. It wasn't any details of the brand. It's not really what it's saying directly. It was more sort of this feeling of the brand that you're getting from a very zoomed out view of this bottle. 
right? And how it kind of looks and the, the fonts it uses, that imagery on there, makes it just felt more authentic to them, but very much more masculine to them. And for guys who wanted their vodka choice to feel more masculine, this was the one that appealed to them, right? And this then, so our insight on that then inspired a whole new campaign for Kettle One where they um, soon after that did a long running campaign called um, Gentlemen, This is Vodka. And it was about being this real deal vodka. They went right on the masculinity of it, uh, which was a huge departure from where they had been. And it really helped uh, their sales continue to grow. So <clears throat> that's kind of uh, my spiel on the, the unconscious and neuroscience about it um, part of this. I now want to talk, like, give you some ideas for what can we do about it as business owners? How can we put some of this into action? So I'm going to give you three areas uh, to think about. The first is about research, being distinctive, and then building what I call a brand fantasy. So for research, there's two kinds of research. Um, I, I mainly focus on qualitative, but there's also quantitative, which is really running surveys. I would encourage you, no matter what business you're in, to make sure you are doing some kind of research with your customers, consumers. Um, surveys can be easily done today online. There's many companies that will do them pretty inexpensively. Um, if that makes sense for your business and you have kind of an email list or something that you can send them out to, that can work pretty well. But for what I'm talking about here, the sort of deeper associations and what consum how consumers think about your category overall, how they think of your competitors, how they think of your brand, what their feelings and emotions are and behaviors connected to that um, category and brand, really qualitative can be really powerful. And so qualitative just means, you know, talking to fewer people, but getting really deeper. Uh, with those people. So I kind of put interviews here in quotes as the first thing, um, because it doesn't have to be anything formal. Uh, I know, you know, doing the idea of research can be intimidating, it sounds expensive, but really you can do, you can just talk to someone and if you have a store, just, you know, observe people in your store, chat with them casually, right? Like uh, take someone out to coffee who's a, who's a customer of yours, you know, and, and, and kind of just ask them, how'd you get into this category? What made you choose this one? What do you think of my competitors? Um, ideally, it's not you as the business owner, it's maybe someone else, or they don't know you're the business owner, because that can skew uh, how they think, how they answer you. But really just getting, talking to people and trying to probe for some of those more deeper sort of emotional qualities to the brand and category can really be eye-opening. Um, sort of focus groups are the, the standard in this, right? You can get a few people together. Again, it doesn't have to be a formal thing. It can be a few people over drinks, over coffee, whatever, and just have a chat about it. Uh, it can be a few friends who can just be really natural and casual. It's something I particularly like to do um, where people are more relaxed and they can joke and build off each other. It can be really helpful. Uh, and then ethnographies is another technique we use a lot. We're actually going out and doing whatever it is with people. So for alcohol, we're actually having parties or going to bars with people um, or whatever your category is. Just actually go do it with them and, and observe them doing it. And often what people tell you might not exactly match with what they how, how they actually do something or you'll pick up on little cues. Oh, why do they do it that way? Or, you know, is there some sort of duct tape solution that they're using for one part of it that there could be a better solution for anything like that? But Again, just kind of getting to know your, your customers in this sort of deeper way can be hugely valuable and can open up new insights that you can tap into. Uh, I'll just throw this in as a very sort of practical piece of advice that I found really useful. Uh, the Van Westendorp price sensitivity questioning. It sounds very technical. Um, pricing is obviously a huge part of how people see your brand, how premium they see it. Uh, you know, there's very detailed pricing models that can get very technical and you can hire consultants for a ton of money to do a, a detailed pricing analysis for you. But this, if you're doing qualitative, can be you know, free basically, or you can put this in a survey as well. Uh, and it's four questions that were developed that, and you can Google this, you don't have to, you know, this is widely available. But basically if you ask these four questions of people, you can really get a range of what is your acceptable price range. And what many people have found that I've worked with, clients that I've worked with, is that they'll spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a detailed, you know, management consulting company doing, and they'll get, you know, their exact price, or they'll do this, a very simple four questions, and they'll get nearly the same answer. It might not be exactly the same, but it's, you'll get very close with, with these. So um, I've been a big fan of the Van Westendorp pricing uh, model. So you can check that out. Okay, secondly, and this is maybe um, the most important thing here and probably the biggest takeaway is just be distinctive. 
Um, if you have heard of Byron Sharp, he's a professor of marketing at the Ehrenberg Base Institute, uh, wrote a book called How Brands Grow that's become sort of a Bible to marketers. Um, and his whole, his, his sort of main point is that to be memorable, you have to be distinctive, right? But this is sort of the key to brand, brand growth. And, you know, these are sort of examples here of memorable, distinctive assets from brands, right? And I'm sure you would know all of these, or at least most of them. Um, and not all of them are a logo, right? Some of them are an icon or a mascot or a little blue pill itself or the like button or a slogan. It can really be anything, but these are things that make your brand stand apart and, and connect in people's minds. Of course, these are big, famous brands, right? And they have a lot of money to sort of build these assets. But still, I think the lesson applies that having some sort of edge, unique personality that people can connect with you and your brand that makes it stand out in their mind uh, really goes a long way. And I, yeah, so basically what I'm saying here, you know, stand for something, be known for something. You can maybe find something that's really true and authentic to you and your store, or your brand, or your whatever it is you're selling and exaggerate it, accentuate it, right? Say, this is what we're about. This is what you should know us for. And I would give it the test of these three things, right? It has to be true to you, of course. Don't, don't try to stand for something you're not. Consumers will sniff that out. It'll feel fake. Um, it's true to you, but then it also fits with something your customers want, right? Like it fits with a vibe or a style that they will find attractive. And then of course, distinctive, it has to be different from the competition, right? Um, if others in your category are all having the same sort of style or, or personality or um, you know, different element, what can you find that's even slightly different and then bring that to life? Um, you know, in the classic sort of Coke versus Pepsi, Coke, you know, the liquids are very much the same, right? They're or very similar anyway. Of course, people argue which is their preference, but they're very similar. But Coke, maybe because they're the classic, right? They kind of want to be known as more nostalgia, Americana, classic. Um, they stood for happiness for a long time. Whereas Pepsi, being sort of a bit newer, a bit, you know, edgier in slightly way, can they exaggerate that and be much more of the now, of more of the youth, right? And they just took those slight differences and, and split the brands pretty far apart. Uh, I'll give you some examples here from some smaller brands. Uh, Death Wish Coffee, I've seen this come up a bunch lately. You know, they just said, we're gonna be the world's strongest coffee. Very simple thing to say, but that makes it stand out, right? And if you're someone who has that caffeine addiction and you're looking for the strongest, it's like, okay, that's the one I'm gonna go for. And they really went far with it, right? They, I mean, they're naming themselves Death Wish. They have a skull and bones on their bags. Uh, you know, they're saying we are super strong. And if, if you're, you're, maybe we're not for everyone, but if you're for this, you'll like us. Or, you know, the moving company, College Hunks Hauling Junk, you know, kind of a funny name, uh, having a bit of fun with it. They know their customers, people who want something moved or they want their junk removed. You know, they don't need a serious brand. They, if it's fun and sounds approachable and easy, great. That Those are nice associations that they can connect to that brand, you know, and it's a very memorable name. It's very distinctive. Every other moving company has some, you know, sort of basic name. I think they really stood out. They made their bright orange trucks. Um, I saw one driving on the road with me a couple of weeks ago and I, I made a mental note. I was like, oh, that's such a great example of, of distinctive branding, you know. Uh, and this is the sock brand is one I just recently came up, uh, came across. They're called Endure. Um, spelled E-N-D-U-R. They make endurance or socks for endurance athletes. But as you can see, they have really interesting uh, designs, right? They have all kinds of wild, colorful designs that really stand out. And apparently they've, they've grown tremendously. They're doing a huge business uh, in socks, right? Something very basic. They have tons of competitors, but they are really standing out with a totally different look of their socks that people are proud to kind of display, right? It's not something you wear under, it's actually wear over your leggings, right? Because you want people to see your socks. Um, so great example of distinctiveness there. And then to get out of sort of a product world, uh, on the left here is Coronet's Pizza. So um, I went to school in, in New York City and near us was this pizza place. There was you know many pizza places that we could walk to, uh, many of which have gone out of business since. <laughs> but this one is called Coronet's and they have giant slices of pizza, right? The pizza I would say is probably about as good as all the others around us but it's huge and everyone knew them as the place with huge slices and while all the other pizza places have come and gone or you know the whole neighborhood's kind of changed coronets has been there for decades now uh, and it's still going strong it's written up a ton people are posting on instagram you know whenever they eat there like this right all they did was make their pizza bigger you know a lot bigger and made slices and they are standing for it and they are you know done incredibly well with that or this is kind of a personal example of the, the drum center here. My son is taking drum lessons right now uh, and we were looking to buy a drum set 
And this place we found near us, it's sort of super old school. This is a picture they have on their wall of when they opened decades ago. Uh, it's kind of a dirty old place. It's super authentic. The guy in there is this old drummer who's played in old jazz groups forever. Um, you know, we have a guitar center near us. We have all these big shiny places that seem really polished and perfect. But all the drum, I'm a musician myself also, all the drummers I know around here, they love this store, right? Because it feels really authentic. Even though it's like messy, it's honestly kind of dirty in there. It just feels like true, authentic. They love drums in there. They know what they're talking about. And I'm going to trust this place more because it's like that rather than go into the big box store, you know? So again, this store has been here for decades. It's surviving in the age of internet. You know, they can buy anything online. They can go to the big stores, but this place has been doing well because of that, I think, distinctiveness. Okay. And um, you can actually plot, like what is, oops, sorry. Oh yeah, skip slide. So third thing is build your brand fantasy and then leave a little bit of time for, for questions after this when we wrap up. Um, in the book, I talk about, about your brand's fantasy. And this is really mapping those unconscious associations for your brand. You can write them out just like we had that um, connection of collection of associations for the cow or any concept, right? Like the Puma brand has cats and dogs. You can do it for your brand. So I chose a brand here. I was thinking of the North Face, um, although people often think I'm, I'm talking about REI here. And I said, what are some of the things they stand for in people's minds, right? And maybe it's the great outdoors. Maybe it's you know being in the elements. Maybe it's adventurous, right? And these would also have their own connections and these would be interconnected, right? So you can actually say, what do I want my brand to stand for? And, and think about it strategically rather than helping it, hap, um, letting it happen by accident, right? You can plan it and say, here's how I want to be different from the competition. Here's what I want people to feel when they think about my brand. Um, and then I encourage people to always go away from just the literal conscious associations. You know, when you're writing the words down, these are somewhat emotional. They can be somewhat conscious or, or literal or rational, but then go to the abstract as well. Just give your brand a feeling, a mood, a vibe, a style, right? That, that you kind of stand for. This was a, a startup whiskey brand that I was working with. And we kind of landed on this as what their brand would feel like. You know, in whiskey, you're not really going to say something. You don't really like have a, a meaningful differentiation. Yeah, there's the taste to talk about, sure. But what is the brand sort of, what's its style? That matters as much to consumers probably more than any of the sort of functional aspects. Um, and so, you know, without any words here, you kind of get a sense, obviously it's a very masculine brand, but it's also a bit refined. It's very classic. It's timeless, right? It's premium. You get all these sort of feelings just from this collection of images here. Um, and then I wanted to show you how I'm doing this myself. I'm trying to walk the talk as well. So my brand that Dan mentioned earlier, I just launched a brand of men's sleepwear, sort of high-end modern sleepwear for men. I was sick of the uh, button-up pajamas that no one my age or younger wears and my friends wear. Most of the guys I know are wearing old boxers or old um, gym shorts or ratty t-shirts to bed. Uh, I wanted something much more modern and stylish. And so I built this brand, Bedfellow. Um, and, you know, we said, what do, what do we want this brand to look and feel like? And, you know, we have some key words up here. We want a dream like Zen, surreal, ethereal, modern, unexpected, right? We wanted this sort of dreamy, dreamlike brand that could have kind of a modern, distinctive style to it, right? Um, we wanted to feel very different from the sort of Hanes and, uh, you know, Walmart brands that were out there uh, and feel premium, but in a unique kind of unexpected way. And so that was our brief, right? We had we told our designers that we worked with and the agencies we worked with, this is how we want to look and feel. We came up with this logo that you see here that has kind of these unexpected letters, right? Feels a little bit off. Even our name, Bedfellow, came from the idea of strange bedfellows, right? And that idea of strange we thought was interesting. This is a screen grab from our website where you know we we have these people falling or you know, some of our Instagram posts on the right, you can see we've, we've done a lot of the sort of dreamy, falling, floating type of feels, you know, mixed in with product and functional stuff as well. We talk about our materials, our breathability, our moisture wicking, all those kinds of things for sure. But I, I still always wanted the brand to feel unique and distinctive, right? And something that had an interesting personality that hopefully guys would connect with. So we launched less than a year ago. It's been about eight months or so and uh, been growing, thankfully, steadily getting into more retailers, selling online, and it's been quite the adventure. So I am in the entrepreneur startup bucket as well with many of you. Um, another brand that I think kind of nailed this was Warby Parker. I love how they chose their name from sort of literary characters. Uh, they feel very sort of um, stylish and chic, but academic and kind of nerdy, but cool nerdy at the same time. They kind of have all these great associations 
Um, they actually built a mood board, and I, I go into a case study of them in the book pretty detailed. Um, they, they really carefully chose what would be in their mood board, like I just showed you with that whiskey brand, uh, and they very purposefully built this brand feeling. Um, and just as one example of that, you know, they did events on school buses, they did events in libraries, kind of all these things that made them feel very academic and chic and cool and kind of old school. Um, but they even sell a monocle, you know, one of those one-eyed glasses things, uh, which I just think is hilarious. I don't think they sell many of them, probably not, but just the fact that they had them in their stores, they got a lot of press for it. It was something very different and distinctive. And it reinforced that their brand is just, you know, kind of unique, a little bit quirky, a little bit nerdy, um, you know, gave them all those right attributes. I love the idea of innovation or having a new product or something that really shows what you are about as a brand. So it's not just your marketing, it's really everything you do um, informs your brand, right? It's your customer service, it's how you package, it's your design, it's your logo, it's your products themselves, it's how you speak, it's your tone, it's everything will be another one of those little associations um, that builds up to your brand feeling. One last point here, um, I talk about this in the book too, but meta communication. This is, you know, I'm sure with your marketing, you think a lot about the words you're saying and what you're telling people, but how you say it will matter as much or even more than what you're saying. And this is what's communicated around your message, like the placement it is, the look of it, the models that are in it, anything like that in your marketing communicates to the consumer as much as their conscious words. So here's a, an example. This is obviously a very simple billboard, right? It literally says nothing really to the conscious mind. Forever 21, right? A clothing retailer. That's it, right? It's just reminding you of, our, of their name. Um, but I think they're actually, to the unconscious mind, saying quite a few things, right? The spacing of their letters, the design feels very sort of modern and sleek. This mirror image of this model, right? Sort of looks sort of cool. That her sunglasses, the way she's looking, right? The look on her face makes me feel like this was a modern, cool, stylish, edgy brand. And it's, you know, reinforcing that in my mind. I drive past this. I may have seen it. I may see it in the corner of my eye for a second. I probably would forget that I've ever seen this ad. If you showed it to me later, if you asked me if I've seen an ad for Forever 21, I probably would say no. But research shows that even if you see that for a split second, those associations of modern, stylish, cool, they'll get into your unconscious mind and can actually be very powerful in affecting how you think of this brand. If I hadn't seen one of these ads in a long time, I might think, oh, that's an old school brand. It's getting dusty. It's tired. But because I've seen this, it feels a bit more modern, a bit more fresh. So just an example of meta communication. Okay, I know I talk fast, but I wanted to get through all that. Uh, just to recap some of the key points here, we're barely conscious, right? There's so much going on below the surface. We're highly irrational, not nearly as rational as we like to think. Emotions are guiding us unconsciously throughout our life, right? We're feeling our way through this world. And then brands exist as those vast sort of messy networks in the mind, just like all concepts do, right? It's, a, it's mostly unconscious actually network in the mind. And then meta communication that I just said there—it's probably more important than you think, right? And so you should, you should really mind your meta communication. So those are my main points. Like Dan said, I wrote a book that goes kind of in, in much more depth on many of these at, um, aspects. I talk about perception, attention, memory, decision making, uh, and then give you the whole back of the half of the book is how you can apply those um, actually in research, in your product development, in your advertising, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, and that is it. If you'd like to reach me, I'm always happy to answer any questions or um, anything you'd want to hear personally. I have my email here. Feel free to reach out. Uh, that's my website or follow me on Twitter. You can hit me up there too. But um, yeah, that's it. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you all for the opportunity here. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a couple great questions coming up. Could you go back to the cover of your book? Yeah. Interest I was interested in the choice of uh, perfume. Uh, you know, I, everything you do is obviously incredibly um, conscientious and you're, you're intending to, to create a certain effect. So I, I'd love to just talk about that, that choice. Yeah, so it's, it was an interesting process that, you know, writing a book is crazy. We, ha we had a publisher who has a lot of say in these things. Uh, my original title for the book was brand, the brand fantasy, which is kind of a key theme for the book. I got kind of vetoed on that and they said we need something else. Um, and so brand seduction became the title because partly, you know, I am saying it is more of a seduction. You're not the way you would woo a lover, right? You're not trying to just, you wouldn't sell yourself. Hey, this, this is why I'm great, right? And like, listen to my, the selling points. You, you want to try to be charming and funny and interesting. And, um, and that's the sort of art of seduction, right? It is kind of works on an unconscious level. So that's how we kind of got to this name. 
Uh, and then the name influenced this choice of covers, which uh, we went through a lot of different cover choices. And then the publisher came back and said, you know, seduction kind of sounds like a, a perfume and you are talking about seducing people and uh, we are kind of branding something. So the fact that you can make it look like a product itself, you know, was seemed interesting. And I was like, okay, let's go with it. You know, it was maybe not as <laughs> strategic as you might think there, but I, I thought the associations were right. Like this idea of seduction, the idea of wooing, well, right. so, you know, perfume as a bit of that sort of relationship aspect to it too. Uh, and then, yeah, it's a product, it's a brand, we're, we're selling something here, so yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have had a couple of different questions that are sort of circling around the same thing, which is when you talk about branding generally, it's easier to talk about consumer brands like Coke versus Pepsi or Warby Parker. Uh, but Stacy Danheiser was asking, how do you approach uh, building a brand for a B2B company or a company that is selling to other companies? Um, and uh, similarly, um, from Fernando de los Santos, he asked, how, do you, how does this approach translate to a services-based business? versus sort of more of a product-based business. So I'd love for you to just kind of dig in a little bit more uh, on, on the B2B and the services side of branding. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it, it does come up a lot. And I know my bias is towards products. And so I'm sorry for that. But I actually think the, the lessons really apply to B2B just as well. You're, you're still talking to humans, right? And this human decision-making is the same across, it's been the same for you know, millennia, uh, and it's the same for pretty much all decisions we're making through our lives. And it's, it's been shown you know, that even making a split second purchase at the cash register where you buy that impulse buy of a Reese's bar, um, the same processes are sort of in play when you buy a house, right? Like a huge purchase that is considered, that's why real estate agents bake cookies in the, you know, they used to like put that cookie smell in the house to make it feel good, right? Or you want to go on a sunny day or um, they stage it in just the right way, right? So that you have a, that homey feeling when you walk in, right? Because our unconscious is going to be at play even for these very big um, decisions, right? And same with buying a car or picking which college you're going to go to, right? Um, huge decisions. Um, and I think that comes into play even if you're in B2B as well. Uh, and I mean, I personally have examples of that where when I was working at Coke on the client side, we would have choosing which agency we're going to work with, right? Which is a service business, it's B2B. Uh, and the agencies would come in and our discussion afterwards, you know, of which agency we're going to go with would be, yeah, a bit around what they said, but who do we just vibe with? Which, what was the chemistry right with? You know, do we feel like they're, they have the creative sensibilities that we need? And, you know, and I, I would joke with the people I'm working with, I'm like, that agency came in with like the coolest sneakers and the best ripped jeans, and they just looked cool and creative. And I honestly think that's why we're leaning towards them, you know? <laughs> uh, and now we're like justifying it by that. And of course, that's a creative industry. But, uh, you know, if you're in any industry, you know, I've worked with Dropbox and others that, that do it, they, they needed to feel their sort of cool for that category. You know, each human who's on the other end of that business decision in a, in a company making the decision wants to feel like I trust this brand. I can go with it, right? Like IBM was the classic example of, I have a ton of trust. They're the big name in the room, right? Um, or Dropbox is going to give me the right sort of service or information I need or whatever it is. I still think you're, you're playing on those same, I need to differentiate from my competition. I need to build the right associations. Maybe in B2B, that is more about credibility, trust, competency, those kinds of things. But then some aspect of coolness isn't the right word because it's not actually cool, but some sort of style and, and personality that differentiates you and that people can connect with you. And I still think is, is just as relevant to services and, and businesses. Absolutely. And, you know, um, one of the things is we love to say at BizHack that all marketing is human to human. Yeah. Um, because if you are a B2B or even a B2G company, ultimately there are people inside of that organization that are making the decision of whether to buy what you're selling, even if the payer is going to be the corporation and has to get past the CFO. So, so you have to, all, it, marketing is a deeply human endeavor, but it's also a, a kind of one to many endeavor. So you know, the, the, my main difference, I think, between sales and marketing is marketing is you're trying to reach a lot of people at once, and sales is usually more one-to-one -one or one to a, a small group. Um, and so attending to sort of how you present and, and sort of how you build trust 
is incredibly important. Most of the companies that uh, are on today's webinar are, are micro enterprises, very small budgets. Um, you know, they don't have a, a branding expert. They are the face of the company. So if, if you had to give some advice about that, um, I mean, what we talk about at BizHack is tell your business story, right? Talk about who you are, what you do and why you do it, because people will buy, you know, as they, as they sometimes say, uh, why you do it, not what you do. And so I'd just be interested in, in the neuroscience spin on that in terms of, you know, as a small business owner, you are the most powerful brand definer and marketing asset for your company. And at what point, um, you know, how do you, how do you leverage that? And then if you could also talk about like, at what point in the evolution of a company, do you have to disentangle the owner from the brand? Yeah, yeah. great questions. Uh, I think it's true, yeah, for most startups or founders and, and small businesses, it is the person behind it is most of the brand, right? That's what people will see. Uh, and so it is, you know, you are your own personal brand. And so there are all these details that you should be consciously aware of that will communicate to other people, right? So how you dress, how you behave, how you present yourself are all going to cue things about you and, and to people, right? And, you know, it's that blank instant judgment that we as humans tend to do. We, we see someone and we, we tend to size them up. And, you know, we say we shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but that is the human nature tendency, right? And evolutionarily, it made sense. We would you need it to kind of quickly size up. Do I trust this person? Do I not, right? Is this a threat or is it not? And so humans are hardwired to make those quick judgments. And so it's, you know, being aware of that, right? I think we know when we go out on a job interview, we want to project the right image and shake hands properly and speak a certain way and dress a certain way. The same is true in like any sort of business interaction you're having, right? With your customers, you can kind of think, am I portraying the right sort of image, the right style? Uh, and then am I being distinctive in the right way as well? You know, you can still bring that to it too. Like, don't think I'd have to fit into this sort of box of what a business person is. Can I use what's true and authentic to me as a person to kind of maybe accentuate that and, and bring that out and not, not shy away from it? Like, I think a mistake people often make is rounding out some of their edges, right? Being afraid to lean into what makes them different. Um, but I think what we see in branding is that it is those those differences that make you interesting, right? And that make you stand out. And it's like, um, you know, be true to those. Like, uh, if, if they're not off-putting and they're not going to turn too many people away, but if they're true to you and you think it, it's a it can be a benefit at least for some of your market, then go for it because those people will probably love you for it, even if it turns off other people. Uh, one one of the things that. We, I, I have a journalism background, and we used to lot, uh, talk a lot about writing with voice. Um, and so as a writer, they were always saying, you know, that's a really voicey writer. Or that writer really has a very distinctive style. And it's true. There are certain writers where you could read their writing, their prose, and know who they were without even knowing the byline. Mm. Then I moved into radio, right? And they don't talk as much about voice and radio because literally your voice is your voice, right? It's like who you are and how you articulate is your distinctive style and that's what you put out on the radio. And I think a little bit that brand is a little bit like what writers talk about when they talk about voice, which is it's not something you create, it's more something you discover. But it's not your essential, it's, 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 it's sort of like there's certain aspects of who you are that you're going to kind of pluck and accentuate and that will become your brand. It's not your full self. It's a part of yourself. It's a projection of yourself. And, and just to kind of, what happens is over time, that piece of you gets like disentangled from the more complex and multi-layered version of you that is your, you as a human being. And that brand lives on and gets owned by other people and accentuated, but you are sort of the seed of it. Yeah, that's right. And sorry, yeah, I didn't answer the second part of your question before, which is, you know, it, so the brand starts with the founder often, their personality, what they bring to it, uh, but then it has to get um, codified, right? And so that other people can use it, it can live beyond that person. Um, often that, you know, you'll see kind of a theme from that founder still live on through a brand. 
uh, but then it has to get you know said directly in a brand book so that anyone can can you know produce against it. But what I've actually often found is many brands then lose their way and forget that initial founder's vision and and what they inspired this brand as it becomes more corporate and big. Um, and off like we you know I've joked about this with the agencies I've been at and with consultancies that so many times it's about finding what's what's true in your original DNA and going back to that and then bringing that out in a new way that fits with the modern audience and modern culture today. Um, I worked on a class, an example as Playboy, uh, the magazine. Um, actually, we got to interview Hugh Hefner and go to the mansion. It was crazy project. Uh, but a lot of that brand had kind of gotten all over the place. And it said, you know, the original sort of like idea was to be this maverick, you know, be this sort of uh, counterculture sort of thing. And we, you know, we advise them, can you, can you tap back into that, right? Like, and bring back, that was sort of core to who Hugh was and how we started the, that brand. And, um, you know, can you, in, can you imbue this brand again? Cause right now it feels very old and dusty and it kind of lost that sort of ma maverick edgy feel to it. And other brands have taken that spot from them. Yeah. But yeah. You know, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to go to we have a few more questions and would love to take a little bit of extra time with you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I think one of the most kind of practical and actionable uh, pieces of guidance here was about research um, and specifically about like speaking to your customers and interviewing. And um, I'm interested in just digging in a little bit deeper. Let, let's say you're a small business owner uh, maybe you're a consultant, maybe you're a solopreneur, maybe you run a small retail shop. Um, how would you recommend going about this kind of research phase, which, you know, it's interesting. I, I almost called it a discovery phase, uh, but I saw you kind of react with that. So I'd love, like, to me, the brand is there, whether you uh, recognize it or not. It's like, the difference between being a small business with a recognize, like with a defined brand and not is how conscious you are of what you're projecting. Because um, it, it's sort of like, it, since it is so closely aligned with who you are and you're out in the world representing your business, it's almost like kind of finding, identifying, and then really being conscious about pushing forward that version of yourself uh, as a representative of the company. So, so part of the answer to the question might be asking people to reflect back on you what they see. But I'd love to hear you just talk about that research phase and how a small business can kind of, that, that, that's everyone, nobody, everybody should make the time and, and, and it doesn't cost any money. So that's definitely something we all can do. Right. Yeah. There are ways to be very scrappy about it. You know, I do a lot of research for my clients. It can cost a ton of money, um, but you can definitely be scrappy. And uh, like I was saying, you know, just ask some of your customers to have coffee with you or, um, you know, surveys can be done free or, or, or almost cheaply. Uh, you know, it's, it, there is an art for sure of asking the right questions. Um, and if you are going to do qualitative, you know, if you are going to do a survey, I would say kind of maybe read up on survey questions and making sure you're asking the right things and in the right way. But for the qualitative side of it, you know, getting some, it can even be friends in the beginning and, and, you know, trying to remove yourself from being the owner is sort of a key thing. Cause I, you know, you're going to be doing it yourself most likely. Uh, but there's an immediate bias. If people know you're the owner, they don't want to insult you or they want to say the right thing to you. So either, so when I was starting Bedfellow as an example, um, I did some surveys with friends. I said, and they know I work for other brands all the time. So I said, hey guys, I'm working for the sleepwear brand or I didn't even say that, I, but I, I made it sound like it was for a client and not for me, you know, um, so that they would give me honest advice uh, and they didn't know that it was my thing that I was starting. Um, and I asked about their sleeping habits and what they currently wear and things like that. And I got, you know, plenty of feedback. Um, and then I even showed concepts of like, you know, written up directions that I wrote up like, oh, here's a potential brand. Like, what would you think of this? Is this interesting to you? And um, they thought it was for a client of mine and not for me again, right? So I could hear their, their real act, you know. So that, that's something concepts I think is good. Um, when you're asking people, it can be hard for them to imagine something new and different. So I like to put some kind of stimulus in front of them. So writing up, you know, if you're showing some new idea or some new product or some new service, and just write up a description of it in a sort of ad-like way and say, read this. And can you give me any feedback on that? That can be done online. You can send it out to people uh, or you can just show them in person and have a chat about it. Um, but yeah, you know, it can be informal. It can be friends. You could maybe get a friend of yours to do it so that it's not you directly. Uh, again, just trying to remove some of that bias or say, you know, it's for a friend of mine, if you know, they don't know that it's your business, anything like that, that you can kind of remove yourself and, and get more honest feedback. Um, 
And I always like, you know, just a, as you're thinking about your questions, is a very practical uh, tip. Start really broad. Talk about, you know, even in, I often talk about people's lives and their goals and their dreams and what they're trying to do and achieve, and then get to their the category, the overall category. Um, I think many entrepreneurs will say, what do you think of this in my business right here? Before you get there, I would say, take your time, get to know the person, what they're trying to do, how they think of your category overall, what other sort of brands or businesses they've used within the category, what do they think of the different ones? You can do different exercises too of like ordering them or clustering them into different groups. How do they fit? How does yours fit within that? Um, what is your superpower? You know, there's, there's different ways to kind of ask these in fun ways and that get people talking uh, that can show, like you said, it is a, a discovery. Maybe your brand's already there, but you're trying to pull out what are those unique, interesting pieces that my brand can stand for. And so any kind of those more fun, I would also say Google projective techniques and projective exercises like the collage mm. I, I wrote about um, or I mentioned earlier. There's others like that, like storytelling, um, filling in word bubbles, things like that, that are just easy and fun to do and actually get people out of a conscious, rational mind. And, and you can get a bit deeper and get some more of those associations. Yeah, because I think, I think what you were saying is the associations are primarily emotional in nature. Yeah, it can be a mix, right? There are conscious associations too. So like your, your price, your service, your product, your space, your look, all those things might be conscious associations that you have, but you know, those are probably pretty obvious and you can see them. What, what's gonna be more interesting and what's actually gonna guide people is what are those emotions that they're connecting to your brand? So that's where you wanna do these techniques to dig deeper beyond those conscious ones. Like I said, yeah. with the kettle one versus Grey Goose example, right? Like the conscious ones were very similar, but it's in that unconscious level that they really differentiated those brands. Yeah, that's really good. So there's um, the conscious and then the unconscious. Uh, and then there's, I think like the concrete and then the more kind of emotional. So for instance, when I think about BizHack, like our, our concrete benefit is if you, you know, do our training, you will make more money. But I actually realized uh, that it's really what we're selling is control and confidence. Mm, yep. Control over your marketing, which feels out of control and confidence that you know what you're doing. Um, because I realized that though, yes, we can make you more money, um, that is almost more of a byproduct of having control and confidence of the marketing of your business. And so um, what that means is that when I am in public, I'm controlled and confident. You know, I um, try to, see, you know, no matter what's roiling beneath the surface and no matter how the business is going, uh, I always want to sort of project, you know, a successful um, business. And it's funny, um, a lot of times when things are going the worst, uh, is when people call me and say, Dan, you know, congratulations on all your success. Um, and I, I sometimes uh, joke that uh, I feel sometimes like a duck on a pond with his feet, you know, um, because you want, if, if, you're, if your business is selling control and confidence, you know, you have to be the duck, uh, no matter how, much, how rapidly you're, you're, do, you're doing your feet. One last question before we wrap up. You are yourself... Um, two things, right? You're a thought leader um, and uh, you're a thought leader around the connection between neuroscience and branding, but you're also now the, the owner of an e-commerce brand. Um, and um, very interesting to me, you know, it's very unusual for a, a thought leader, someone who really sells his knowledge and his consulting services to then go and create an e-commerce sleepwear brand. And I'm just really interested in that. You know, we have a lot of serial entrepreneurs who are here with us today uh, who are having ideas a mile a minute. Uh, and you um, probably had a lot of choices uh, as to how to spend your time and what kind of brand you wanted to build. Maybe, maybe you wanted a chance to build your own brand because it would be fun to practice that uh, and, and make money on it. Uh, I'm just really interested in that decision to do something so different than being kind of a, a, a pundit and an author and a thought leader, but actually like also an e-commerce sleepwear <laughs> owner, business owner. Yeah, yeah, maybe it is crazy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I always had kind of this entrepreneurial streak and wanted to do something on my own. And I had dabbled in a couple side hustles, some smaller brands that I started on the side while I was doing the consulting and the brand strategy work. Um, they both did pretty well. One, I ended up getting acquired and it got nationwide distribution. 
so that was great. But I was like, you know, I want to do something where I can really go all in. And it was also just from a personal development perspective, like this is a new challenge. I was very excited about it. I wanted to kind of go all in on something and consulting. I like the consulting work, but uh, I was always like, you know, what's next? What, what else can I do here? And, and it'll be a new, whole new experience. It'll be a lot new learning. And yeah, it'll be really putting, you know, what I think about branding into practice, right? And this was sort of a category where I felt like it was in need of it. I would go to the department stores and you see kind of all these old school legacy brands charging very high prices for, you know, not great feeling button down suit things that just felt so old fashioned. And I was like, there's a, there's a space here for a really modern brand that appeals to people in a new way that, you know, modernizes the whole category, brings new people into the category. Um, the challenge, of course, is most guys who are, who are my target are not buying something in this category right now. So we're, we're looking for a behavior change, which I would definitely advise people to go against, right? Like that's a, a huge challenge for us. Um, convincing people to to go for it. Um, but yeah, you know, I wanted to put it into practice. I wanted the new challenge. And I, I, I always, always kind of knew I'd, I'd be starting something and running something. And it's it's what I wanted to be doing. And I'm, I'm enjoying the ride, the ups and downs of it, for sure. But it's uh, exciting. For Good for you. Well, you know, they a lot of entrepreneurs say to me, I want to make money while I sleep. Uh, and I think in your case, it's you want to make money while your customer sleeps. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So anyway, uh, best of luck with Bedfellows and with all your endeavors. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and Danilo, thank you for bringing Daryl to us in this way. Amazing. So um, I'm going to uh, just quickly talk about the upcoming sessions uh, of the series. And then I'm going to stick around for a few minutes and talk a little bit about uh, biz hacks offerings. And so, you know, feel free uh, to stick around or not, uh, Daryl, but thank you again. So uh, coming up guys in um, the masterclass series next week, we're going to talk uh, uh, in two weeks, I should say, we're going to talk about mindful marketing with Suzanne Jewell. Um, this is uh, an incredibly powerful session. Suzanne's an extraordinary presenter, uh, owner of The Mindful Entrepreneur. Uh, and then uh, the week after that, we have Rosemary Ravenal, formerly uh, head of communications at Univision, talking about the power of storytelling. You know, one of the really core uh, foundations of marketing from the BizHack perspective and, and one of the essential elements for any small business that wants to make the best use uh, of uh, the neuroscience cues to, to build your brand. So um, thank you guys so much. Um,